Let's start this morning by turning to the Gospel of John. Uh, and I was, um, as part of the preparation for this lesson, there was a, a verse that, that came up that uh, was from John, and then a couple other verses I want to emphasize here, is, uh, here before we get into the uh, continue on in our lesson in the history of the churches, church, churches in modern times. And um, it's been a long journey through this, uh, through this series. But uh, we are slowly approaching the end, slowly but surely, maybe a few weeks to go. Uh, and next, the next series will be, we'll be going through a book of the Bible, and I'm very, uh, looking forward to that. That's normally what we do, either a uh, book of the Bible or doctrinal uh, topic, uh, but we've spent quite a bit of time on history of the churches, which I guess some of the feedback has been, it's been very uh, helpful, beneficial, interesting, and it's been interesting to me. Um, some of the things that I, on the surface, was familiar with, then got to get a little more acquainted and familiar with it, so it was uh, uh, very helpful and interesting to me as well. So we're not quite done with that yet. Uh, but uh, Gospel of John in chapter 1, and we have the account here of, um, well, first of all, a description uh, of Christ starting in, in chapter 1, and then John the Baptist uh, in verse 15, it says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have, we all, have all we received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And, uh, and he, they were asking, uh, the people were asking John, who, who are you? And he said, I'm not the Christ. Uh, they said, are you Elias, Elijah? Or, or you the, he said, I'm not that prophet. Uh, uh, he says, no, I'm not that prophet. Um, and he says in verse 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Uh, and that's Isaiah that we know him by. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, why baptizest thou then if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. And, uh, and turn over to John, actually, before you turn to John chapter 3, notice he says, he, who, he it is who is coming after me is preferred before me in verse 27. Preferred before me. Uh, and turn to uh, John chapter 3, John chapter 3, and verse 30, John the Baptist said about Jesus, He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And uh, in verse 36, he goes on, and in verse 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so, what do I want to emphasize this morning? The emphasis here, because of where we're at in our, in our uh, uh, study and our learning of the history of the churches as we've moved up into modern times, and we've started all the way back at the apostles and moved all the way, uh, so we've covered a lot of ground, but... What we're looking at, especially today, we've, we've already seen some of this, but we're going to continue to see some of this among some of the key individuals, and particularly we're coming from, uh, I mean, we, we can't possibly cover all the churches in modern times, so we're covering what would be uh, similar, what would uh, be most uh, similar to us or, or we would be uh, more familiar with regarding heritage of, of churches and influential individuals and groups. Uh, and as we've been looking at the, um, we've looked at what's the term fundamentalists, uh, fundamental Baptists, and the reason we called fundamental was that as theological liberalism, modernism was into getting into more of the churches, uh, as, as far as especially mainline denominational churches, uh, there were groups of people who said, no, we still believe in the fundamentals of the faith. Uh, we believe in the uh, the inspiration of Scripture. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe uh, in the blood atonement of Christ, uh, and those those things that they called the fundamentals. And that's how the term fundamentalist. But not every fundamentalist was considered a Baptist. Uh, so there's the term fundamental Baptist, saying, "All right, Baptist," uh, but at the same time believing in the fundamentals of the faith. 
And so there were many who took a stand. They said, we're not going to, uh, uh, we're, we're going to take a stand for the Word of God, for the inspiration of the Word of God. We're going to take a stand for salvation through Jesus Christ and faith in His shed blood on the cross. Uh, we're going to take a stand for these numerous things that, that we believe. They said, these are fundamentals. Now, of course, one of the uh, uh, downsides of that was it shouldn't be up to us to choose what the fundamentals are. I mean, Bible doctrine is Bible doctrine. Uh, certain doctrines are more consequential uh, to uh, some doctrines are more consequential than others in what they lead to and, and, and the result of them. But Bible doctrine is very important. And so the fundamentalists said, uh, many of the fundamentalists, they didn't view the mode of baptism as a fundamental of the faith. So as long as you believe this, this, and this, you're considered a fundamentalist. Um, but as we've, as we've gone down through, there are many who, who uh, were very instrumental in taking a stand for truth of, of what the Bible says and, uh, and the deity of Christ and his shed blood uh, and salvation through Christ and the virgin birth. But one of the downsides which has been consequential as the decades have gone on was that many of them got too filled with bigness of themselves and what they were trying to build trying to build the movement, trying to build their organizations, trying to build their churches to such an extent that it became uh, uh, too much of a making a name and being uh, uh, too self-aware of who, who, who here, who here is who I am. And this is what we'll get into more today. Or not just who I am, but then those who would look at other big influential individuals and, and, and get the focus on the individual rather than the truth rather than the uh, message and what they were trying to do to begin with. And so that's why I read those verses is that John the Baptist had the attitude, he is preferred before me, he's preferred above me. Talking about Jesus Christ, that John the Baptist had his time of ministry, but he was simply the forerunner to Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ, it was time for Christ to start his earthly ministry, John the Baptist willingly stepped aside and said, it's his turn. He's the one I've been focusing on. He's the one I've been pointing you to to begin with. And then he said, uh, he must increase, but I must decrease. In other words, the time was coming. John the Baptist's ministry was coming to an end in a large part. And now he's there uh, giving way to Jesus Christ, who was going to increase in his visibility, his ministry, his teaching. And that was what, that was what it was all about anyway. And so that was, that's one of the lessons that we can learn is that uh, we've, we've, we see a lot of good f of, as far as uh, uh, sound doctrine uh, that was being stood for and trying to say, no, we're not going to go the way of, of theological modernism, but we're going to take a stand for what the Bible says, and uh, we're going to take a stand for unapologetically. And many of them did that. There were certain key individuals who did that, but unfortunately they got, many of them got too wrapped up in themselves and the bigness of what they ended up what God allowed them to build, uh, and uh, and ended, I think the consequences have have um, only come about in, in as the decades have gone by, where you see then as it fizzles out, uh, many of that has has much of that has fizzled out uh, when you look at what they had uh, had built. Uh, but what is still re what still remains though are the individual churches. You see, it wasn't all, ever about a movement. It ever was, wasn't ever about an association. And as we've seen, they, they loved the associations. They loved the organizations. But really, God's institution is the local church. And uh, as we still see today, there are individual churches who are teaching, preaching the message of God's word, regardless of association, regardless of bigness, regardless of who the big man is. And, um, and I think that's, that's what, we see that spirit in John the Baptist. We see that attitude in John the Baptist uh, that he's saying, look, as we've seen in the past weeks, there were certain ones, they didn't want to let go of their ministry. They, they just kept on going and gone when they should have passed it on to other able, well, qualified individuals to uh, carry on the work, but they were so wrapped up in what they were doing. So, um, so we see, and this is, this is just meant to be honest as far as the history of it. We look at the good, we look at some of the bad, we look at uh, the, the various things and, and be honest about it because we can learn from both the good and the bad uh, and then carry on from there. Now we've been uh, talking about Southern Fundamental Baptists. Now these are not ones who 
stayed in the South, meaning this isn't just churches that were in the South. It was individuals, though, who got their start in the South, Many, some of them in Texas, some of them in other places. And, but their influence, so culturally speaking, the culture of the churches, the focus of the churches was different than the ones in the North. There were some just a personality differences. Um, and so this, but the Southern influences ended up in a lot of places in the North or in a lot of places in the Midwest where the Northern did not necessarily influence uh, the South as much. Um, and so today we're going to talk about John R. Rice, as promised. I said that last week. We're going to talk about John R. Rice, and he lived from 1895 to 1980, and he was one of the most influential preachers in the fundamental Baptist movement. Uh, and he took a stand for biblical inspiration, the deity of Christ, sub Christ's substitutionary blood atonement, salvation by faith. He was had much of an emphasis on, on witnessing, on trying to win souls for Christ, uh, the premillennial return of Christ, uh, he was opposed to modernism. He was opposed to uh, worldliness uh, and formalism, meaning um, that the I need to come up with a better def I need to come up with a good definition of formalism. But formalism, <laughs> not meaning that you dress formally, act formally, or have formal services. It's it's that that is the focus. That it's it's basically being too stuffy. I guess if that. That, if I can say it that way. <laughs> we come in and we do our thing and there's no life there. There's no, um, I guess that's the best way to say it um, without getting to his definition. I haven't even looked up when they use the word formalism. I haven't even looked up what they even mean by that. I just kind of have my own idea. But I think that's pretty much uh, uh, what they're talking about. Um, but he was opposed to those things. He was a pioneer at a great spiritual vision and faith in God. Now, he came from a solid Christian family. His father was a pastor. His mother was a prayer warrior. Uh, his mother died when he was six, and she asked her children to meet her in heaven. In other words, she said to them, she just wanted them, would they also believe on Christ? Would they trust in Christ so that then they could meet her in heaven someday? Uh, he made a profession of faith at age nine. He got it settled at age 12. Apparently he had some doubts, but he got it settled at age 12, and he surrendered to God's will at age 20. And he worked his way through Bible college with, with uh, hard work, uh, paying his way uh, through, through Bible college. He got married in 1921 and led a godly home. He married Lois Cook in 1921, and they had six daughters. Um, he was a poor man who ate meager portions of food. He didn't have much. Uh, he wore patched clothes, but Lois came from a wealthy family, a very wealthy family. She would buy... $15 hats. Now back at that time, a $15, that was a lot. That was, that was a very, very expensive hat. Um, and uh, I don't know what you'd compare that to today, but let's say you bought a hat for probably a couple hundred, a few hundred dollars, would maybe be similar to that. And, um, and many of us here, I, I think the average person would never dream of buying a several hundred dollar hat. Um, but uh, there are people who can afford that and not even think about it. And that, that's, that's, that's just the, the reality, and that's where she was with a $15 hat. Um, and, but at the same time, he apparently challenged her on that uh, at one point after they got engaged, and she chose to um, change her lavish lifestyle after getting engaged to Rice. She decided, all right, yeah, I'm not going to go quite to that extent anymore. And uh, so she, she chose to change that. Um, all of their, and, and by the way, once again, I've said this before, I say it many times, is that there's nothing wrong in and of itself with wealth, nothing inherently wrong with having wealth, uh, but when wealth becomes the goal or wealth becomes the, the idol uh, before God, uh, then that, that can be a big distraction and become what we live for as opposed to uh, living, putting God first. And John Rice was one who uh, wanted to put God first and, and what God wanted him to do, uh, whether he was poor, whether he was rich. And all of their daughters uh, ended up trusting Christ as their Savior, and they served the Lord in Christian homes of their own. Uh, and their home was a place of putting God first, strict discipline, and a strong spiritual atmosphere. Uh, he boldly denounced theological liberalism. Um, and as I've already mentioned about that, as far as theological liberalism, he took a stand for the inspiration of Scripture, divine inspiration of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, uh, the the blood atonement of Christ, the virgin birth, and, and the various uh, things that go along 
uh, with those fundamentals and uh, uh, opposite of theological liberalism. Uh, his preaching ministry began in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, he graduated from Baylor University, uh, which has a v still has a very, very indirect affiliation with the Southern Baptist Convention. As a matter of fact, I looked into that a little more, uh, and there's a Texas Association of Baptists that it actually had a more direct affiliation with, but that Texas Association of Baptists is a member of the Southern Baptist Convention, and also, a few years ago, uh, they are also a member of the uh, the lar it's the largest Baptist organization of churches in the world, and I don't remember the name now off the top of my head. I didn't write it down. So it's not a direct Southern Baptist affiliated uh, school. And at one point, uh, Baylor was also able then to choose its own board, so they were not necessarily as much controlled, uh, led by that association. So there's still um, uh, a, a certain connection there uh, uh, for Baylor with, with Baptist but uh, not uh, as strong as, as it was before. Um, and he also attended classes at, but at, at that time though, Baylor University was more directly connected with, the, uh, with Southern Baptist. Uh, he attended classes at Southwestern Theological Seminary. He was pastor of the First Baptist Church of Shamrock, Texas from 1924 to 26. He was associated with J. Frank Norris, which we talked about J. Frank Norris uh, in previous weeks. Uh, he began denouncing the increased liberalism and error of Baylor and the Southern Baptist Convention. And that was something J. Frank Norris did as well. They had some serious differences uh, with the direction Baylor was going and with the Southern Baptist Convention. A committee from the local Southern Baptist Association visited Rice and told him to stop warning of error and to end his association with Norris or else he would be blacklisted in the county and the state. Um, Rice responded by going on to Norris's, which Rice already had a pre-existing uh, uh, relationship with Norris where he would go on his radio station. So Rice's response was going on to Norris's radio station and uh, the following week and telling the story, uh, what had happened. <laughs> that was his response. And as you can see, the, and this is similar to the the, 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 many of the, these individuals that we've uh, focused on here, uh, a lot of the same spirit, a lot of the same. I mean, you want to talk about hard line in the sand. They did. They, you want to talk about uh, uh, having some fight in them. They had some fight in them. And uh, sometimes that was a good thing. And then other times, if you got fight in you, but it's in a fleshly way, uh, carnal way, then that can be damaging and, and, and not, a, not pleasing to the Lord. But anyway, that's what he did. Um, Rice's stand for a six-day creation account preceded and had an influence then, but it preceded the modern creation science movement that was pioneered by Henry Norris. Henry Norris and John Whitcomb wrote uh, the book, uh, The Genesis Flood. I think that was the, the main one. Genesis Record. There was, I think that was the first one. Uh, it was back in the 60s or 70s. Um, and that's what launched the modern-day uh, creation science Movement. So Rice uh, had an influence in, in what led to that. Um, Rice saw many miraculous answers to prayer, and he was um, he was uh, let's see, very emphasis, uh, very emphatic about prayer. He wrote a book called Prayer: Asking and Receiving. Um, he uh, one of those answers was said to be that during uh, three there was three days of rain during a drought in West Texas. Uh, after praying at a revival meeting. And, and I mean, there was just suffering going on with all the drought that had gone, been going on. And they had three days of rain. And he apparently, the way the story goes, is that he prayed and he, he said, we need, I, I believe God wants us to pray that it would rain within the next 24 hours. And uh, if, if, if the rain comes after that time, then we know it wasn't God's answer to prayer. But if it comes, but it's sometime in this window of time and the rain did come. And, you know, that would have been before they had all the modern weather. And you could say, oh, but he just looked at the weather forecast and he's just uh, setting it up that way. I don't think they had the same. He wasn't looking at the, the seven-day forecast and, and saying, yeah, there's a big rainstorm coming. Now, maybe his bones were starting to ache and then he knew to pray for that. But um, I don't know. But anyway, that's the way the story goes. But uh, many answers to prayer in his ministry. And he, he did emphasize prayer. And, and, and this is to his credit. He believed in asking and expecting great things from God. 
that was a good, good thing about him was that if we believe in, we serve the almighty God of the universe, why not ask and expect great things from God? Of course, according to his will, we must always pray in submission to his will, but, but still believing in great things from God. Uh, he began publishing, and he's, he's known, uh, best known for this, I think, uh, publishing the Sword of the Lord newspaper in September of 1934, and circulation peaked at 300,000 in 1975. Um, Rice never took a salary from Sword of the Lord, and he wrote 200 books and booklets which have had a distribution of 60 million. Uh, even though he was a pastor in his early ministry, he was primarily an evangelist. He had the heart of an evangelist. He had a passion for seeing souls saved, seeing people saved, and, and that, that was a defining mark for who he was. He uh, wrote a couple of hymns. One was called Souls Are Dying, and also another one, which I think we have in our hymnal, is called So Little Time. Uh, I think that's in our hymnal. Um, you, you don't have to find it right now, but, um, <laughs> but it's called So Little Time. And so what it was, those are songs of challenge, songs of challenge to people saying we need to, to tell people about Christ while there's still time, while there's still opportunity, because there's such little time. Uh, Rice and Norris, so John R. Rice and J. Frank Norris parted ways in 1936. Uh, and this was... Um, now, we already talked about what kind of person J. Frank Norris was. He had such so many good things about him and what he stood for and what he did, but when it came to those who disagreed with him or he thought disagreed with him, he was not always the nicest person, uh, and he could re actually be downright harsh. And Norris accused Rice of holding some errant uh, Pentecostal doctrine, and he published this in his paper called The Fundamentalist. And um, Norris even tried to have Rice's evangelistic meetings canceled. So, I mean, it's one thing, you know, you're trying to warn about somebody's like, uh, uh, you know, has a lot of publicity. People know, you know, a, a public figure in that way among Christians, you know, among Christians, Baptists particularly. And um, it's one thing to, if someone feels the need, they're going to warn about them, say, hey, this, this person believes this. You should know about this because this goes against what uh, normally we believe. But then he went so far as even have try to have some of his meetings canceled. Um, Rice answered the accusations in the sword of the Lord. So they used their papers to, I uh, guess, <laughs> go back and forth. Uh, Rice did. Now, here's the thing, that Norris was not completely wrong. Uh, Rice did hold some unscriptural doctrine regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts. For example, he taught that the baptism of power for evangelism should be sought just like on the day of Pentecost. And um, typically we would believe that, Bible-believing Baptists typically would believe that that was a, a one-time experience that was the empowering of the, the believers there. Uh, and, and, the, the, uh, and it was power for fulfilling the Great Commission, for preaching the gospel, but it's not something you need to continue seeking in the same sense uh, the way Pentecost, because there was the, that was initially the Jews received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Then later on we saw that, then you see that the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. And so there were certain times when that happened, but it was very, very, uh, very narrow examples of that in Scripture, just a couple of examples. And nowhere are we told to seek that in the same way as on the day of Pentecost, because when you trust Christ, you get all of the Holy Spirit in you, and it's just a matter of how much control the Holy Spirit has in your life. And so Norris was not completely wrong, but he greatly exaggerated Rice's errors. I mean, he uh, Norris characterized it as, as basically one of the greatest heresies of the day of what Rice was doing, which was uh, definitely a, an exaggeration. Um, and Rice urged but Rice urged his readers to forgive Norris and to support him. So Rice responded more in a gracious fashion. Uh, but there was something to what Norris had said, and there was so that nothing necessarily anything wrong with trying to raise the subject. But Norris, uh, with his um, just his the way that he was, uh, was uh, didn't quite. Uh, he was more of the bull in the china closet type of person. So. Uh, Rice moved his ministry to Wheaton, Illinois, in 1940. Uh, Wheaton College at the time still taught the fundamentals of the faith, but uh, they became influenced by new evangelicalism around that time. Uh, Rice joined Wheaton Bible Church and was a member there until 1955. 
1940, Rice hosted large evangelistic crusades hosted by multiple churches, uh, which and these were interdenominational. Uh, and then we saw that that was one of the characteristics of the fundamental movement was a lot of interdenominationalism as long as you believed in certain fundamentals of the faith. Uh, in 1945, Rice began conducting annual evangelistic revival conferences, which later became known as Sword of the Lord conferences or Sword conferences for short. Uh, and then Sword of the Lord still exists today with Shelton Smith as president and editor. Uh, Curtis, Hudson, uh, Curtis Hudson was the president and editor before Smith uh, and after Rice. And Smith took over after Curtis Hudson passed away. Uh, they also, they still continue to host the Sword of the Lord Conference each year. I think that's generally held at a church in Walkertown, North Carolina, particularly, typically. Uh, John R. Rice's relationship, and this is one of the people we'll talk about um, in future week, uh, in the next, next couple weeks here, uh, was, was Jack Hiles. So John R. Rice and Jack Hiles, now you want to talk about certain figures, Jack Hiles is, a, is a, quite a... Um, I don't know what's the word I want. <laughs> people love him, or people see. Eh. So we're going to talk about all that, you know, when we uh, when we get to that. But um, John R. Rice's relationship with Jack Hiles began in 1956, and really, Jack Hiles was the next. You, you could say a lot of the things about John R. Rice were carried over into Jack Hiles, um, so, and I think Jack Hiles might have even taken things farther than. John R. Rice did, but, um, but this was the first year that Hiles spoke at a S.W.O.R.D. conference. Uh, the speakers were, uh, the other speakers were Rice, Bob Jones Sr., he also had an affiliation with John R. Rice, and R.G. Lee, they were the other preachers. Hiles was pastor of Miller Road Baptist Church in Garland, Texas at the time. He had been voted out of the Texas State Baptist Convention uh, for associating with independent preachers such as Lee Robertson, and we'll talk about Lee Robertson as well. And actually, the Texas State Baptist Convention, that's the name, I believe, of the group that's affiliated with Baylor University. Um, the Texas State Baptist Convention is a member of the SBC uh, and Southern Baptist and also the other, uh, another uh, Baptist uh, organization. In uh, 1957, Hiles was on the board of the sword. I did that on purpose. Um, the board of the sword. He was on the board of the sword. And he became director of the sword conferences in 1962. Uh, in 1972, Rice and Hiles held 28 conferences attended by 10,000 preachers. Yeah, the sword conference held in Dallas in August of 1975 had 8,000 in attendance in the evening and four to 7,000 during the daytime services. Speakers were Hiles, Rice, Jerry Falwell, Jack Van Impey, Tom Malone, John Rawlings, Ed Nelson, Bill Dow, and Bill Rice, who is John's half-brother or step-brother. It was said that in 22 years, Rice and Hiles sat together on the same conference platforms over 2,200 times in every state except one. Uh, Rice was like a father to Jack Hiles, and uh, this kind of explained to me, though, some of the things about Hiles. Uh, was, we were talking about this last night, and my wife said to me, I didn't know this about Jack Hiles, was that his, his father was a drunkard, and uh, left him in when he was a young boy. Um, and so here's somebody like Jack Hiles who's growing up without a father, and he looked at, at John R. Rice as a father figure. Um, Hiles' daughter, Cindy, wrote, as they took one trip together, Dad confidentially asked Dr. Rice this question, could I be your adopted son? I promise I will not be presumptuous should your answer be yes. Dr. Rice agreed, and this began one of the great preaching partnerships of all time. From that forward, Dr. Rice became like a father to my dad, and dad never forgot to honor him on Father's Day. Um, trying to find a good stopping point. We're coming down to the end here. and I'm not sure we're going to make it to the end of the slides, but, uh, but we're coming down to the end. Let's see. Let's, I think we'll do one more here. Um, Hiles promoted... Uh, what we call quick prayerism or what has been called quick prayerism at the sword conferences. In, in other words, not uh, um, basically just trying to get decisions, um, shallow, shallow salvation testimonies, uh, shallow dealing with people as far as the gospel is concerned. Um, and uh, 
So quick prayerism, some people call it easy believism. But it's better to call it quick prayers because it's not hard to be saved. It's not hard to trust Christ as your Savior. But it does, in, it does involve a, a conviction in the heart, a knowing that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And the way that they would do that, though, is they would preach and you know, they'd, you know, people would get stirred up and some of it you know, would, be, uh, you know, would be kind of an emotional experience for some people. And so, yes, they would raise their hand. They want to they wanna trust Christ. And, and then they'd say, all right, well, just repeat this prayer after me. And, well, yep, you prayed that prayer and now you're saved. And so there were, now let me just say this, John R. Rice had many, many, many um, souls led to Christ over his ministry. So this is not uh, saying that, um, uh, that he, his, his ministry was not without fruit. But they were not careful in dealing with people when it comes to salvation, or they were not careful about letting the Holy Spirit convict and lead and guide people that they would then that would then prompt uh, uh, trusting in Christ. And as I, I think I said this last week or the week before, that in the book of Acts, if you look in the New Testament, the book of Acts, what did they do? They preached the gospel, and if the people were convicted and convinced of their sin and their need for a Savior, they responded, or they asked, what must I do to be saved? And so, but what happened was it turned into more of trying to present the gospel to then just lead to someone praying a prayer. And so it turns into this... Um, this uh, system here, or this um, uh, the method of, yep, if we just do this, this, and this, and now all of a sudden you're ready to pray and trust Christ. And there might not be conviction there. Then some people might be hearing the gospel for the first time. Some people might have a head knowledge, but it's really not hit their heart yet. And so it's a matter of, yes, being zealous about preaching the gospel, telling people about Christ, but at the same time letting the Holy Spirit do the work of conviction. And, and if somebody really wants to be saved, they're going to they're going to trust Christ. If they really want that, <laughs> they, we don't, they don't need uh, uh, a, a certain method to try to get them to pray, the, pray a prayer. Um, and yes, the Bible does say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says, for the first thing is you believe in your heart. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so it needs to start in the heart. It needs to be that heart belief. And they were not careful. They, they wanted the big... And, and we aren't going to get to this in our lesson today, but they wanted the big numbers. They were focused on the big numbers, and that became the focus. So how many people got saved? How many people, to a certain, and then they would sometimes talk about how many people got baptized, but most of it was how many people were, were led to Christ. Uh, and, um, and so that turned into, when that became the focus, when, when the numbers became the focus, then it turned into now we need to do what we can to pump up those numbers. And uh, that was one of the downfall downsides of that, because the fact is, I'd rather have somebody know that they're not saved, and rather than somebody to be led in a prayer and being told that they're now saved when they really didn't have it in their heart, and now they think they're saved. It's kind of inoculates people to the true gospel and uh, and true conviction of the Holy Spirit, and and that's that's been repeated many many times through the years. Um, so that's, that's where we're going to stop. I think that'll be a good, good spot to stop. Otherwise, we'll get into another whole, this, we go a while yet, but um, with what I have here. But.